hi everyone. Um, I hope you're all having a great day so far. Uh, thank you for coming despite your busy schedule. Um, first off, I'd like to welcome you all to another informative webinar with the topic um, long-term success after bariatric surgery. Well, I'm sure this whole hour will be worth your while because you'll learn a lot from our presenter. She is Caitlin Mock, a U.S. registered dietitian, certified by the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. She formerly served as the lead bariatric dietitian for the Ohio State University Medical Center. So today she'll be talking about long-term success after bariatric surgery. It'll be a 30-minute presentation followed by a 30-minute question and answer session. Now on your panel, you can type your questions uh, on the chat box. I hope you can see that. Um, it should be there on your screen. Just type in your questions and at the end, I'll be uh, choosing uh, which question to ask Caitlin. And if you have more questions and we run out of time, you can always visit our knowledge base section or you can, um, you can join our private Facebook support group, uh, which you can see on your screens right now. And we do appreciate any feedback and suggestions for future webinars. Okay, so without further ado, I'll, I'd like to give the floor to Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, thank you, Hazel. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we're going to talk about long-term success after bariatric surgery. We'll discuss uh, maintenance diet, what that looks like and entails, different foods to avoid or use caution with, how to deal with weight loss stalls, what happens if you've lost too much weight, emotional eating, and managing expectations. So most people at this point are about six months or post-op or further and can tolerate around three quarters of a cup to one and a half cups of food. Now for those of you that are maybe a little bit um, you know, closer to post-op, that six month range or so, you might not quite be at this point. Or even if you're two years out and you're not quite at this point, that's completely fine. You know, don't push yourself. Um, but most people, like I said, can tolerate about that three-quarter um, portion of food at least. Now, foods that are heavier, so like meat, uh, a heavier vegetable like a potato or a steamed broccoli or something, you're going to be you're having a very small portion of that compared to maybe a, a broth-based soup or something. So kind of keep that in mind as well. So at this point, you also want to start focusing more on incorporating fresh fruits and vegetables. There's less emphasis on protein, but it is still very important. You'll want to be aware of old and new habits that might be finding their way back in. Exercise and general activity are extremely important um, at this point, even more so than immediately post-op. And making sure that you're continuing to check um, your vitamin and mineral levels at least every year. If this is your first year after surgery, recommend um, getting them checked at about six months or so. So what does a maintenance diet look like? This is basically um, the, the starting point. I always recommend three servings of non-starchy vegetables every day. Now, what does this mean? So a starchy vegetable is corn, potatoes, peas, and winter squash like an acorn or butternut. Now, these vegetables uh, that are starchy are still very healthy. They just usually do not have as much fiber, and they tend to have more calories in them. So we just want to be cautious with these a little bit more than, say, your um, lettuce, spinach, broccoli, cauliflower, peppers, onions, and whatnot. You also want to include two servings of fresh fruit. Um, you could also have frozen or, or even canned, um, but I think the, the fresh or frozen variety is usually the best. So the canned, even canned vegetables or canned fruits, they are still, um, or they do still have a good nutritional profile, but because they are more processed, they tend to have more sugars in the fruit or more sodium in the vegetables. So if you're looking for a canned variety, look for a low sodium, and if it's a fruit, look for a fruit that's been packed in its own juice. So a serving is about one cup raw or a half cup cooked, or one quarter cup dried. So that pertains more so to your dried fruits. Now, 
Again, these portions might not be where you're at. That's fine. Don't push yourself. If you can't get the full serving in, I would recommend at least having you know three different kinds of vegetables or two different kinds of fruit every single day to get that variety. You know, the variety of, of nutrients that you get all comes from the variety of foods that you eat. So if you're only eating, you know, apples and oranges and, and cauliflower every day, you're not going to get all the nutrients that you need. So you want to have that variety. Now, three servings of whole grain is important as well. Now, some people um, have a difficult time with certain grains and starches at this point. So um, if you're not able to do bread yet, once again, don't worry about that. You know, beans and lentils are another good source of, of grains and those um, complex carbohydrates at this point. Uh, a third a cup cooked brown rice or quinoa is considered one serving. So I really want to make sure people understand that, a third a cup cooked. And this is also includes something like a, a pasta as well or spaghetti. And then aiming for about 7 to 21 grams of protein at a meal or snack. This is going to depend on, you know, what meal you're having, what snack you're having, and what you've had previously in the day with how much protein you're going to be able to get in. An ounce of protein, whether it's um, an ounce of, you know, fish with meat, um, you know, maybe beef or pork, poultry, one ounce is about the size of two stacked dominoes, and it's seven grams of protein. A three ounce piece of meat is about the size of a deck of cards, and that's 21 grams of protein. So you always want to think of your, your meat proteins as going in multiples of seven. So always trying to get that at least seven grams per meal if possible. And then dairy, I put this with the question marks behind it because some people have an intolerance to dairy a little bit further out from surgery. Um, that lactose enzyme has a little bit more difficulty getting digested. So as long as you're getting your calcium supplements in, you don't have to have dairy necessarily in your diet. But you'll want to make sure that you are getting that calcium supplement and that you're continuing to take it separate from any iron-containing supplements that you have. And iron's frequently in your multivitamin, or you can take it separate as well if you've had an issue with iron before in the past. So example diet, uh, this is just uh, you know, an idea of what you could do during the course of a day. Once again, these portions may be too much for a lot of you. That's completely fine. Just adjust them as needed. Um, but this is a, a pretty decent idea of how you can get a variety during the course of the day. Uh, some of these foods we'll discuss a little bit later. It might be some, difficult for some people, like the chopped nuts, uh, dried fruits, like the unsweetened craisins can be difficult for some as well. So listening to your body, you know, if there's anything that you do not tolerate, please, please avoid it. So here we have the two-ounce um, piece of pork tenderloin. Once again, that's going to be about 14 grams of protein. Um, and there's even a little bit of room, if you can see at the bottom, for some fresh fruit and a little bit of dark chocolate, too. Here's day two. Once again, just an idea of how you can create some variety in your diet. Um, and then it shows you the, the grams of protein that are provided with each meal. Um, this is an average, so just kind of um, take that into consideration. And then once again, um, watching the portion sizes. Salads can be difficult for some, easy for others. Um, once again, just, just be cautious with that. Maybe you can only do a half cup of chopped romaine, not a whole cup. That's completely fine. Again, it's more important to have a variety than to get too hung up on the exact portions. So snack planning and mini meals. So after surgery, I kind of tend to think of most uh, times that you're eating as a mini meal because the meals that you're going to eat now hardly resemble the meals that you ate before surgery. So this is just a little chart to kind of help you get some ideas for planning quick and convenient meals or snacks on the go. So the first column, the lean protein and heart healthy fats, are things that you will um, you know, can usually grab in a, in a hurry, uh, lunch meat, uh, keeping a, a jar of nut butter, whether it's you know, peanut butter in your office or maybe a almond butter at home in the fridge string cheese, hard-boiled eggs, unsalted nuts, cottage cheese. You can do this in individual con 
to-go containers or um, a big container at home, whatever you like, and then your complex carbohydrates. So your complex carbohydrates are fresh fruits and vegetables. These can also be cooked fruits and vegetables, I should say, as well, and whole grains of some kind. So if you look at the bottom, air popped popcorn is actually a whole grain as well. Once again, this is a food that some people have a difficult time tolerating. So listen to your body. If it's the first time you have anything new, you want to be extremely cautious and go slow and have a smaller portion than whatever is listed. So when you're planning your mini meals and snacks, try to have one of the heart healthy fats or lean proteins and one of the complex carbohydrates at each of those mini meals. And then once again, just adjust portions as, as you tolerate. So maybe you'll have a half a cup of the reduced fat cottage cheese, and maybe you can't do a half banana, maybe you'll only be able to do a third of a banana. That's completely fine. But once again, just having that balance of the lean protein, heart healthy fat, or and or the complex carbohydrate. This helps to not only satiate you, so make you feel satisfied, but also keeps you full longer when you have this combination of the protein and the, the complex carbohydrate. So foods to take caution with. So there are really no truly bad foods, more so poor choices. The only food that I can think of that really has no nutritional value is, is soda because there's just plain sugar in it. There's not even fiber. Um, it's basically just you know straight sugar water and no vitamins. So that's the only kind of food that I really think of as a complete no-no. Um, but almost every food does have some nutritional quality. Now, once again, you can have almost all foods, but we just can't have them all at once. So it's really everything in moderation. So if you're having uh, a donut for breakfast at work, say Sally brought in donuts for Bob's birthday, um, you know, that's fine. We want you to be able to have a donut and enjoy it. You know, maybe have a smaller donut or a half of a serving. Um, and then that later in that day, you know, if everyone's going out for lunch, try to order maybe a healthier lunch instead of, you know, a burger or fries or, or pizza or a steak or something. You know, maybe a grilled chicken salad or a vegetable beef soup. You know, everything in moderation. So just try to plan things out during the course of the day so that if you do have something that's more of an occasional food, you're having healthier foods around it um, to kind of balance it all out. Also, it's important to know yourself. I always use the example um, for me, and that's that I love chocolate in just about every single form possible. And for me, Oreos are a no-no at our house. I cannot have them in the house. If there's a gallon of milk, I cannot stick to that two cookie portion size. It's impossible. So I don't buy them. There's one time a year that we have Oreos in our house, and that's for the Super Bowl, and that's it. Other than that, you know, I know that I can have an ounce of dark chocolate at night, and that portion size is going to satisfy me. Am I going to want more than that? Usually. But that one ounce will keep me satisfied and kind of, um, you know, curb that craving enough that, that I don't need to have more. So just knowing what those trigger foods are for yourself. You know, don't keep trigger foods in the house. If you have other family and loved ones there, talk to them about this. You know, if they want to have some of these foods, you know, tell them to, to put them in a place where you don't see them, you don't know they're there, um, to kind of, you know, to protect you and to have everyone around you kind of on the same, the same page. So the other foods to really be cautious with are the, the simple sweets and simple carbohydrates. Uh, the, what I like to call them is the crispy, crunchy carbs because these are the foods that tend to go through your stomach pouch very easily. They break down very quickly. Potato chips are a great example because they almost turn to, to nothing in your mouth, right? They kind of just dissolve. And so they go through a pouch very, very easily. So you have to really watch these foods closely. If you're going to have you know, a chip or pretzels or a candy of some kind, look at the bag. Look and see what a serving size is, and then physically count out that portion. So for potato chips, normally it's going to be an ounce serving, and it'll say something like about you know eight potato chips. So physically count out those eight chips. It doesn't even matter if you pick out the biggest ones, but count them out, roll the bag back up, and put it away. And then this is the other important part, is to sit down 
and enjoy those. Try not to stand up um, because there's an act of, of standing and kind of being distracted that you, you don't fully enjoy the food that you're eating. So really try to sit down and, and eat those and savor each one and then you'll be done. And you're less likely to, cra to crave those foods later if you've really taken the time to enjoy it in the moment instead of just hurrying through it. All right. Other foods to use caution with, um, fibrous vegetables like celery, broccoli, cabbage, and Brussels sprouts. Once again, these foods are, are very healthy. They're, they're great. They just tend to be a little bit more difficult because they are so fibrous. So if you really like these foods, that's fine. Um, try steaming them so that they're, they're very soft and tender the first time. And remember that dime-sized bite. Um, keeping maybe a, an example of a dime on the table is a, is a good reminder that you don't want to have a bite bigger than that when you're eating some of these things. Nuts and seeds are another one that can kind of be hit and miss for people, so be aware. And then breads, rolls, and pasta. So these starchy foods tend to swell when they're in your stomach, and that's because if you, if you think about if you're cooking pasta and you leave it on the stove, it tends to continue to cook and gets a little bit bigger and soaks up all of that water. Well, the same thing kind of happens in, in your stomach pouch when your food mixes with your saliva and some of your gastric enzymes. It can kind of continue to swell a little bit before your body starts to break it down. And that can make people feel like they have um, like a bowling ball basically stuck in your stomach. It's a very uncomfortable and, and unpleasant feeling. So weight loss stalls. This is probably the most frustrating thing for people. It's completely normal and it does happen to, to everyone at some point or another. So I think it's really important to understand kind of why this happens and what's going on in your body. So initially when you're um, post-op or really even if you've been on any diet in the past, you tend to have that rap rapid weight loss the first couple of weeks after surgery or once again after you've you've gone on a diet. And what's happening is as your body is adjusting to the lower amount of calories that you're taking in, your body's burning something called glycogen. And glycogen is a storage fuel in your liver. And part of that glycogen molecule is water. And so as your body breaks down this glycogen, this stored water is also released. And that is what contributes to most of that rapid weight loss that you have. So when you've gone on that diet and you lost, you know, five pounds in a week and you're so excited, most of it's just water. So I don't want to take away from that excitement, but I want to kind of put it in perspective that you're not really losing um, that quote-unquote bad fat that you, you want to lose. Another part of the weight loss stalls is as you lose the good fat, you also tend to lose some muscle mass. That's just kind of how it goes. If you continue to, to work out as you're losing weight and as you're, you're you know, on this diet and eating healthier after surgery, um, you still will lose a little bit of muscle mass, but not quite as much as if you don't work out at all. So as you lose a little bit of this muscle mass, this slows your metabolism as well. And that slow... A slowing of the metabolism is what leads to the slowing in your weight loss. Also, old habits or even new habits may be creeping in that didn't exist before after surgery. So being aware of all of these, these potential um, issues. So what do you do? Shaking up your routine is, is one of the best things to really kind of to start fresh. So one, if you're having a lot of extra calories in your diet, if you're noticing there's a lot of grazing going on, if you're eating out frequently, not choosing good foods, and you know your calories have kind of gotten out of control, um, you can decrease your calories. Uh, doing the food journal, which we'll talk about a little bit later, can be beneficial with this. Now, if you're six months out or um, even maybe a year or so out or you're not eating a lot of calories, be really cautious with this because what happens is if you cut your calories back even more, you're only slowing your metabolism down even more. You might lose a little bit of weight initially again, but eventually that metabolism will continue to slow and you'll reach an even bigger stall. And so, um, you know, just avoid this really. If you think about people that are um, 
you know, prisoners of war or that are in, you know, famine-stricken countries, you know, they can survive months on and even weeks on enough, next to nothing but, you know, water and maybe a couple hundred calories. And that's because our bodies are extremely efficient and our metabolism can just slow to a certain rate that keeps us alive but basically stops any further caloric burn. So once again, be cautious with decreasing your calories even more. Another thing to do is to work out longer or harder. This is normally my first go-to recommendation when someone's reached a workout stall, especially after surgery, because this tends to be one of the, the biggest problems is, you know, we can find the time to cut back our calories because it, it doesn't take a lot of time, right? But trying to find that extra time to go exercise is really difficult for most busy people. So this one area is, is probably the most difficult, but I think the most important as well. So maybe increasing it from 30 minutes to, to 40 minutes, or try changing up your speed. So instead of walking for three miles an hour on the treadmill, try to bump it up to three and a half miles. Or if that's too much to do for the whole time, maybe try doing three and a half miles um, for just a minute or two, and then going back to the three miles an hour. But those little increases and that speed is going to help to not only increase your metabolism a little bit, but it's also good for your heart health as well. Increasing the resistance, if you have like a bicycle or an elliptical, is another good idea. So if you're at a level six resistance, try bumping it up to a seven or eight for a minute or so at a time and then coming back down. This is also a great way just to stay kind of entertained at the gym. This is one of the only ways that I can stay motivated is to kind of play a little game with myself of, you know, how long can I go at a, a 7 or an 8 on the elliptical and then backing it back down. And once again, it's not just good for your metabolism, but it's also really good for your heart health to get your heart rate up and then to bring it back down. Also, changing your exercise habits. If you are doing the same activity day after day, you're tending to use the same muscles day after day. And so you have to use those different muscles to build new lean muscle as well. There's a bunch of different activities. This is just a small sampling, you know, from yoga, Pilates, uh, getting a bike, lifting weights, Zumba, swimming. You know, just find something that you like. You know, you don't have to be, uh, you know, 23-year-old and weigh 120 pounds to, to go to a Zumba class or something. You know, try different things that you enjoy. Activities of daily living is another really good way to raise your metabolism. So when you're standing up and cooking, you know, you're burning more calories than if you just go to a restaurant. You know, taking the dog for an extra walk during the day is a great activity that you might do every single day, but don't really think about it as being exercise necessarily. Um, you know, using a push mower instead of the riding lawnmower, or if your yard is really big, Maybe just pick a section of the house that you can use the push mower instead of the writing. Walking or taking the stairs at work instead of the elevator or maybe using the stairs instead of the escalator at the mall is a really big way to increase that metabolism. Once again, not only are you doing an activity that's um, you know, good for your muscles, but it's also good for your heart. And usually taking the stairs at work is faster than the elevator, at least in, in my experience. So again, looking at old habits that might be creeping in or new ones that are developing, going back and planning your meals, the further we get out from surgery, the less exciting it is to sit down and plan our meals and do the grocery list and go do the grocery shopping and whatnot. But if you can take that time, it really is one of the best measures of success long term because you get in the habit of, of finding the importance of this. So I put down one of my favorite websites, which is cookinglight.com, but there are literally hundreds out there. Um, so, you know, go ahead, experiment. And when you have some spare time, you know, do some searches online and see what, what websites you find that you might like. Uh, another thing that I'll do a lot of times is if I have, um, you know, a lot of broccoli in the house or um, cauliflower or some vegetable that, you know, all I do is ever, you know, I just steam it. I'll go to one of these websites or I'll just go to Google even and type in a healthy broccoli recipe and see what comes up. You know, you might have to click through different recipes to find something that you finally really want to try, 
but this is a good way to, to have new flavors and new foods come into your life as well. Because if you only steam broccoli, you know, it gets pretty boring after a little while. So um, shake it up a little bit. And then another big trick of mine is to, to avoid shopping um, or doing your grocery shopping on the same day that you plan your meals or doing your recipe search. Separating these couple of days out really does help to just kind of keep everything fresh and to not feel um, kind of burdened by the whole process. Also taking a look around your cupboards and your fridge, look to see what foods are maybe starting to creep their way back in. Uh, maybe little things that you're able to just you know grab in a hurry that aren't the healthiest choices but are easily tolerated. You know, be careful with a lot of those foods because those tend to add up pretty quickly throughout the course of a day. You know, then when in doubt, uh, always go back to eating your fresh vegetables and, and fruits. I cannot say this enough. Most Americans especially do not get enough of these foods. Um, really, you know, think of them as the mainstay of your diet. You know, we tend to be a meat and potato kind of nation. But if you can think about incorporating more of these vegetables and fruits, you'll be better off for it. And then making sure you're also eating enough. You know, once again, it goes back to that, that metabolism. If you're cutting your calories so low, your body's not going to continue to burn at the same rate that it did before. And then again, once more, going back to exercise, uh, resistance activity is important for everyone, but especially for women. We tend to have less muscle mass than men. And this is why if you've ever gone on a diet with your husband or maybe a male coworker or a male relative and you've done the, the same workout plan, the same diet and in a couple of weeks he'll have lost five pounds and you'll have gained a half a pound. And once again that goes back to the fact that women just tend not to have as much muscle mass and we don't tend to focus on increasing our muscle mass as we get older because we don't want to appear bulky, right? So. You know, I promise you that if you, you know, work on your resistance activity, you will not get bulky, you will not look like a bodybuilder, um, but focusing on that resistance is really what keeps those lean muscles and keeps that metabolism high. And then after all this, if you continue to struggle or even before all of this, you know, please reach out to a dietitian. I am always here to help you if you need assistance. If you'd like to find someone in your area that you can go and speak to in person, that's also a really great idea. Um, but just please reach out. That's what we're here for. So what happens if you've lost too much weight? This is actually more common than a lot of people think. You'll want to definitely continue to exercise regularly. A lot of people will just stop exercising and that's probably one of the worst things you can do because once again you're just lowering your metabolism but it's also really bad for your heart health and just your general health. So avoid eating junk foods to gain that weight back. Instead try to focus on incorporating more of those healthy fats into your diet. So things like olive oil, nuts and seeds if you tolerate them, avocado is another good one and I'll use avocado Oh, and so many things, not just with your typical guacamole, but I'll make an egg salad and instead of mayonnaise, or maybe I'll use half mayonnaise, I'll use an avocado or with a tuna salad. And it imparts this really good kind of rich buttery taste, but it's a heart healthy fat. So that's a really easy switch to make. And then canola oil, you know, salmon and other fatty fish like mackerel and herring are really good as well. And then your nut butter is like peanut butter and almond butter. All right, emotional eating. This is probably one of the, the hardest things, um, I think, to, to get over, um, you know, with your new lifestyle and postoperatively. And emotional eating does tend to kind of um, dissipate for people initially after surgery. And I'm not exactly sure why, if it's just kind of the excitement of everything. Um, but it almost always comes back at one point or another. And people that, you know, have a difficult time with emotional eating, this is extremely frustrating to hear, um, but there is a lot of hope and you you really do have to work at it. You can't run from these emotions. You really have to kind of, you know, face them head on and deal with them and it's, it's a difficult process to, to work through, but I've known so many people that have done that and, and are better for it. You know, it tends to kind of be something that always lingers a little bit 
but with the proper tools, you can really help help to manage it and, and to get over the, the big aspects. So especially, you know, to begin with, if you can, find a therapist or a counselor. You know, insurance companies are getting better at better at, at paying for this service. A lot of them still have yet to catch up to the times, but, you know, try to find someone that you can really connect with and resonate with that you can talk to, you know, and then we'll talk about journal writing as well with this. So here are a few resources that I found really helpful. Um, some of these are from the psychologists that I used to work with at um, Ohio State and in a couple other programs as well. Um, so the Center for Mindful Eating is a good website to go to. This is, once again, just focuses on more of that mindfulness approach to eating. The psychologyofeating.com website has uh, an article on the top 50 emotional eating blogs. Now I did go to some of these different pages and they're not completely about emotional eating. It's just kind of a, a part of their blog for the most part. But there are some really good people out there. You know, maybe find someone that you can connect with that kind of hits home with you and can maybe, you know, give you some ideas of how you can help to, to tackle it from your side of things. Mindless Eating, Why We Eat More Than We Think, by Brian Wansink. He's probably um, my favorite out of this list. And while mindless eating um, doesn't directly, you know, discuss the emotional eating aspect of this, I think if you become a more mindful eater, you're just naturally not going to eat um, emotionally quite as much because it makes you use those tools to kind of prevent that, that spiral that frequently happens with emotional eating. So he has a, a really good website um, and a couple of really good books to check out. Most libraries have his book at this point, so that could be a really easy and economical way to, to look into his information. And then John Kabat-Zinn is a psychologist and a world-renowned meditation teacher, and he has this approach called the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. And this is another good way, kind of using that mindful technique to help reduce the stress aspect of things. Um, his book, oh shoot, I should have put it on here. I apologize for that. Um, but his book is really, really good as well. It is a little bit more, um, once again, just kind of meditative. So it's sometimes it's uncomfortable for people. Um, but if you, if you do get it, I think you'll really enjoy it. So this mindful eating cycle is from Dr. Michelle May's book, Eat What You Love, Love What You Eat. And this is something that I give a lot of patients um, post-op that are having emotional eating or really even pre-op if I can. Because, you know, having this and just maybe putting it on your refrigerator and every time you sit down at a meal, if you can go through this cycle, it really helps you to kind of keep in mind you know, why you're at this meal, you know, and even when you're having an emotional eating episode, keeping this handy really kind of helps to focus your mind and focus your body, and it really kind of can steer you away from going down that path sometimes. So, you know, asking yourself, you know, why do I eat? Am I eating because I'm hungry? Am I eating because I'm lonely, you know, sad, happy? You know, and then when do I want to eat? Is there a certain time of day? You know, for a lot of us, it's the evening is kind of that, that point in time where it's the trigger zone because it tends to be our downtime as opposed to earlier in the day when we're working and busy with, you know, orchestrating life and kids and family. Um, so, you know, if you can focus in on that time and then what do you eat? You know, are there certain foods that you're craving or what are the foods that are around your house? And then how are you eating? Are you eating really quickly? You know, are you eating standing up? Do you eat in front of the television? You know, that's a big trigger for a lot of people, not so much with emotional eating, but more so the, the mindful eating part again. Because when you're eating in front of the television or if you're eating, reading a book, you know, physically you're consuming that food, but mentally you're, you're not fully present. And so people that tend to, to eat while they're distracted also tend to crave foods later on in the day. Because once again, mentally you didn't take that time to really eat and be present with your meal. So kind of pay attention to that if you tend to be a, an evening grazer. And then how much? 
Uh, this isn't so much an issue after surgery because your portions are kind of dictated by, by your stomach pouch size, but um, the further out you are, this may be something to kind of focus on. And then where are you investing your energy? You know, are you sitting at work all day at a desk and then coming home and sitting? Are you maybe on your feet all day at work but not necessarily in an exercise capacity and then coming home and sitting? Um, you know, where are you using that energy throughout the day? Another big part of emotional eating is, is the sleep schedule. So if you're not getting enough sleep, um, you're also having a difficult time regulating your mood and your emotions. Your stress hormones can be elevated, and those include cortisol and adrenaline. And you tend to get more food cravings, because if your body isn't getting the rest that it needs at night from, from your sleep, it needs to find that energy elsewhere. And so it tends to crave very simple carbohydrates. And once again, those tend to be your, your crispy, crunchy carbs. You know, very rarely does anyone crave uh, a big salad after they haven't slept very well. And that's because your body has to refuel. And those crisp, crunchy carbohydrates are a very quick, efficient source of fuel. Unfortunately, they just don't keep you very full for long. So really work on trying to get enough sleep, you know, shutting off the television, putting your phone down. Research has shown that that artificial light that's created from these screens stimulates your brain activity and makes it more difficult for people to, to unwind and to shut down and relax at night. And so instead, try reading a newspaper, a magazine, or book. You can slowly start to dim the lights or use a softer lighting um, as you start to get ready for bed. Or, you know, I'll start doing this even at, at our house um, an hour or so before my son's bedtime to kind of get the children to, to relax as well. Avoid eating a heavy meal and obviously, you know, limit your caffeine in the afternoon and evenings. And then another one of my favorite things to do is to use a linen spray or an essential oil. There are several different ones that kind of help to promote sleep. Lavender is probably the most common one, but I do this almost every single night. My husband makes fun of me for it, but it really helps to me to relax because at this point, you know, just getting that light scent of the lavender on my pillow just kind of brings me into this relaxation state um, that I just associate with that, that aroma. And I kind of feel like I'm in a spa, which is nice. All right, journaling. Um, I'll try to kind of speed it up so we have questions. I know I'm going over here. But a journaling is a really good approach to, um, once again, be more mindful, not just with your food and your exercise and maybe um, keeping an emotional kind of journal as well, but it can also just help you to be more mindful in life in general. It's not something that I usually recommend doing forever. Um, I don't want you to be, have to become that neurotic about doing it, but trying it for several weeks just to see the foods that you're really eating, you know, how much you are exercising, where you're spending the most of your day. You know, maybe it's, it is sitting down at work or maybe you are moving more than you thought. Um, and then maybe trying it for several weeks to months off and on, you know, just kind of depending on, on what your schedule is like and, and how beneficial you find it. So realistic expectations. You know, if possible, you know, I think this is a really important conversation to have with your physician or other medical professional before you have surgery to get a realistic idea of how much weight you can ex expect to lose and, um, you know, what, what your goals are. You know, most people do not get down to a normal BMI of 20 to 25, so keep that in mind. Typically, you know, with an adjustable gastric band, people will lose about 50% of their excess weight. With the sleeve gastrectomy, it's about 60%. And with the Ruin Y bypass, it's about 70%. Now, these are just averages. You know, some people will lose more, some will lose less. But this will kind of give you a general idea. So this means that if you are 100 pounds overweight, okay, you would lose around 50 pounds with the gastric band. If you're 60 pounds, or if you're 100 pounds overweight, that means 60 pounds with the gastric sleeve. And if you're 70 pounds over, or if you're 100 pounds, I'm sorry, of weight, that's 70 pounds with a gastric bypass. So while some of you might be a little disheartened by this, you know, research does show that even a 10% loss is extremely beneficial for overall health. You know, people have a decrease in medications, they lower their comorbidity risk, or maybe get rid of comorbidities. So decreasing your blood pressure, 
maybe uh, your glycemic control is better or you're decreasing your diabetes medications. People can move better, their energy levels are higher, and in general, you just have a better quality of life. All right, we'll go on to the question section. I do want to point out, again, um, if you have a question and we don't get to it today, please go to our, our Facebook page and, and post it there. I will be more than happy to answer your question. And then the bookmark knowledge base section of the Mexico Bariatric Services support page has some really good information on surgery for pre-op, during surgery, and, and post-op as well. Okay, so let's go ahead. I'll see if I can bring Hazel back in. Yeah, hi, Caitlin. I'm here. Hi, Hazel. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that very informative um, presentation. I've learned a lot. <laughs> and I think I can even use some of your tips. Here's her question. When I am busy, I still supplement meals with protein shakes. Is this okay? Yeah, that's fine. You know, I think if you're having, you know, a, a busy day, having that, you know, planned protein shake is completely fine. Um, I do tell people to kind of limit it. You know, if you're having two or three protein shakes every day and you're six months out from surgery, I would be cautious with that because you're losing out on a lot of good other, you know, vitamins and minerals and especially that fiber and antioxidants that you get from, from whole foods like your whole grains and your vegetables and your fruits. Um, but, you know, occasionally, you know, especially once a day if you're using a protein shake, that's completely fine. Um, and occasionally if it ends up being twice a day, it's, it's not a big deal at all. But I would avoid doing it really more than twice a day on a regular basis. But it is completely appropriate to continue to have it now. Well, there were some on the, the Facebook page earlier that I wanted to bring up um, in case okay. not everyone's on there. But uh, one of the questions that I had earlier in the week was someone having difficulty trying to find enough time to exercise. And I think this is a really common issue. We kind of talked about it briefly in the webinar. Um, but, you know, most of us do. You know, we live busy lives. We're taking care of our, our families. We work long hours. Um, so finding that hour chunk to dedicate towards exercise can be really difficult. So... You know, it doesn't always have to happen in, in one-hour increments or 30-minute increments. Um, but finding even, you know, five minutes here, ten minutes there can make a, a big difference in your total metabolism and how quickly you are burning those calories. So, you know, another thing that I'll do at home is if I'm waiting for the, you know, microwave, you know, if I put something in for a minute, I might try to do as many jumping jacks as I can in that minute or, if I'm at work, you know, once again, taking the stairs, if you have 10 or 15 minutes maybe before a meeting, you know, try going out, walking around the parking lot, um, you know, maybe taking the stairs a couple of flights, but these are all little things that you can do that are still beneficial. You know, some exercise, even if it's for five or 10 minutes, while it might not seem like much and it might not seem like it's worth your time, but it's definitely better than, than no exercise at all. Okay. All right. Well, we got two more questions, Caitlin. Uh, constipation, is it a common side effect? Yeah, I would say constipation is, um, I wouldn't maybe use the word completely common, but it's not uncommon as well. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that after surgery, you know, your pouch is much smaller. And so you don't have enough room really to have all the fiber that you would normally get from, you know, your fruits and vegetables and your whole grains. So, you know, depending on how far you are out from surgery, you know, if you're six months or so, you know, definitely start incorporating more of those fresh fruits and vegetables to get that fiber. If you're having a difficult time still, you can go and get an over-the-counter fiber supplement. I really recommend a product called Benafiber. And the reason I like Benafiber is because it's a soluble fiber. So if you're having, if you have loose stools, it can kind of help to add bulk to that stools to help. And then if you're ha having the constipation, it can help make it a softer bowel movement as well. So um, once again, that's called Benafiber. But really, you know, trying to focus on getting your, your fiber in naturally. So 
you know, incorporating your fruits in, you know, adding those extra vegetables, trying to get maybe a little bit of oatmeal as opposed to cream of wheat because the oatmeal has more fiber. Um, sprinkling something like a, a ground flaxseed is another good way to kind of get a couple extra grams. But try to go to your, your fruits, your vegetables, and your whole grains first. And then drinking enough water as well. If you don't have enough water in your diet, your body has a difficult time forming that bowel movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for that uh, answer, Caitlin. Now, there's another question. Uh, can we take normal vitamins like fish oil? Etc. Yeah, well this, this kind of depends on what surgery you've had. Um, if you've had the Ruin Y gastric bypass, for instance, the thing you really have to be careful with there is you want to do um, a sublingual vitamin B12 if possible. You could also do the nasal sprays, but um, just a regular oral B12 might not be completely absorbed. Um, and that's true actually for the, the sleeve gastrectomy as well. Um, and then the calcium supplement, you really want to um, use the calcium citrate. Uh, Citrical is an example of a brand that's a, a citrate form. And that's because after the Ruin Y and the gastric sleeve, your body has a difficult time breaking down the normal calcium carbonate that's in a lot of different calcium supplements. So you do um, have to be careful with that. You can't, quote unquote, use kind of the normal vitamin. Um, but if you want to use like a, a fish oil, that's completely fine, you know, if, if your cardiologist has recommended that. Um, you know, if you are older, if you have a history of, of a heart condition or whatnot, I would talk to your physician before you do some fish oil supplements. Um, there is some new research that shows they, they might not be as beneficial or they could contribute to, um, to blood thinning as well, depending on what medications you're on. So, so do be cautious with that. But in general, yes, you can kind of take a quote-unquote normal vitamin. Do you have any other questions, maybe from the um, Facebook uh, support group? Yeah, so this actually isn't one from the support group page. She's wondering at this point how many grams of carbohydrate she can have. And the reason I really like this question is because I think with, uh, with preparing for surgery and, and post-op um, and just with the whole Atkins diet, we have tended to kind of demonize carbohydrates in our society. And um, yeah. I think we really have to be cautious with this because while we want to avoid those, those simple carbohydrates, and I'll go back to my crispy country carb example before, um, because that uh, tends to be the, where we get a lot of the, the extra calories that add up during the course of the day, but your really good carbohydrates like your, your whole grains, you know, your fruits, um, and some of your vegetables, again, you know, bringing those starchy vegetables in. You, know, you do want to incorporate some of those every single day. You know, your brain really strictly runs off of carbohydrate. If you've ever heard the term glucose, that's the only fuel that your, your brain can run off of. So if you've ever done uh, an Atkins-type diet where you re severely restrict your carbohydrates, after a couple of weeks, your, your brain... Um, and your body just doesn't function quite as sharp as it usually does, and that's because it's depleted of that glucose. And so you really want to make sure that you're getting at least 100 grams of carbohydrate every day um, to 150 grams is really kind of where I, I usually recommend for people. So the, if you're closer to, to being post-op, so maybe that first six months you might only be able to get 100 grams in, um, or a little bit less than that a day. But once you're six months, try to tr look and see if you're getting 150 grams. Now, if you're not noticing anything, you're probably fine and getting enough. Um, but if you are someone that really watches these things closely, do pay, pay attention to that. Now, if you think about like a, a normal slice of bread has 15 grams of carbohydrate just with that. You know, a half of a banana has about 10 to 15 grams, depending how, how long that banana is. So those grams of carbohydrate do add up pretty quickly, um, but that is something to kind of kind of be aware of and, and to not think of carbohydrates as being the enemy all the time, necessarily. Eating food that doesn't fight back, something like that. Oh, do you yes, remember? Yeah, yep, I remember which one. So um, that uh, post was about um, a woman that had a difficult time tolerating a lot of foods, and I'm not quite sure how far she was out from surgery, but there are a couple things to always keep in mind if you tend to have difficulty 
on a regular basis tolerating foods or if there are certain foods that continually are difficult for you. So first off, you know, making sure that if it's if it's a new food or if it's something that is continuing to, continuing to bother you, try making sure that it's very soft and tender cooked and moist as well. So if you need to add maybe a broth to it or a low-fat gravy, um, if it's something like a um, something you can add milk to or even a little bit of water to make it soft and moist, you know, those are all things to help with that aspect. The other thing that I think a lot of people struggle with is remembering to continue to have those dime-sized bites. You know, people that are even a year out or two years out from surgery do best when they have those small bites of food at each meal. So literally, I, you know, would keep a dime on the table or on the counter so that you can have it within, within a quick visual to glance at, to, to remind yourself. But if you keep with that dime-sized bite, most people can tolerate just about um, about anything. And that goes for especially the, the fibrous vegetables like your, your broccoli, your cauliflower and celery, or some of your, your whole grains too, like your whole grain pastas and breads. The other thing is to remember to eat slow. And this is probably the most difficult tip out of all of those because we tend to be a fast-paced society. And if you've if you're still working or if you have worked, you know, most of us don't have an hour-long leisurely lunch. We have to eat quickly and keep going. And if you have a family, this is also an issue. So trying to really slow down at your meal. I recommend people start with no more than two bites per minute. If you're a little bit further out from surgery, a year to two years or more, you might be able to do, you know, three bites per minute. But really, even for, for quote-unquote normal people that haven't had surgery, I would avoid taking more than, than that three bites per minute. And that really helps to give your stomach pouch time to kind of digest everything. Um, because really, you know, once you've reached your point of, of fullness or if your body's really working hard to digest something and you are keep you know, swallowing more and more food, it just doesn't have the room and it will come, come back up. So use those, those three tips. Do very soft, tender, moist cooked foods, the dime-sized bites, and no more than two bites per minute. You know, join the Facebook support group and post all your questions there. You can um, share anything, maybe success stories or you know anything under the sun. Yes, we love before um, and after pictures. And it is a closed Facebook group, so if you're concerned yeah. about the rest of your family or friends or coworkers seeing what you're posting, they won't see it. It's only for those that have joined the group. So I do want to point right. that out. Yes. And any feedback is uh, welcome. Like if you have any suggestions for a next webinar, um, you're welcome to share them with us. Okay. So anything else, Caitlin? No, that's all I have. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming today, and we'll see you at our next webinar, hopefully.